I'm Jeff Meek. I work on the history of marriage uh, project. My research interests relate to dem demographics in 19th and 20th century Scotland, family formation, household structure. I also do research into same sex intimacies, in particular male homosexuality. My book is just out, Queer Voice in Post War Scotland. Uh, and we're having a book launch for that with Professor Geoffrey Weeks here in this room on Thursday at quarter past five. So feel free to come along to that uh, for some wine nibbles and stimulating discussion. So I'll hand you over to Ruth. Yeah. Um, I'm Ruth Vanita. Um, I come from the University and now teaching at the University of Montana. Um, I work on uh, same sex, um, the history of same sex desire in literature, English literature and Indian literature. I have a book on same sex love in India, a book on same sex marriage in India, and my latest book is on, it's called Gender Sex on the City. It's on the playful celebration of sexuality in pre colonial poetry, late 18th, early 19th century. Hi, I'm Julia Moses. I'm at the University of Sheffield in the History Department, and I'm a historian of the modern European welfare state. And I'm currently working on a book on family and marriage policy in the German Empire in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Okay. I'm Mary I'm from Queen's University in Belfast, and I'm uh, just finishing a project on the history of marriage in Ireland from 1660 to 1925. I'm Judy Miller from the University of Texas um, at Austin, and I've worked on a lot of different issues about the family, really, in um, the long 17th century, to borrow Katie's um, term there, but the long 18th century, there was the <laughs> late 16th century to the middle of the 18th century, that's my long 17th century. And I'm um, talked here about um, part of a book I'm working on about young people's social lives, that's kind of a euphemism, the title is, um, as uh, Ruth is referring to, to here, the current title is Sex in the Early Modern City now. Huh? And I'm interested in young workers, um, the sort of ways in which they form intimate relationships with each other as a prelude to marriage, and then what happens if they didn't get married, the sort of uh, make, you know, making up and breaking up um, among young people. I'm Christina Simmons. Um, I'm just retired from the History Department and Women's Studies at the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And uh, what I was working on for this conference was about an African-American advice columnist writing in the 1940s. I done earlier work on creation of modern marriage in the first half of the 20th century US. And uh, this came out of that, this had African-Americans, and now I'm sort of looking at specifically what African-Americans are doing in regard to talking about marriage, and teaching youth about marriage, and then this is an advice columnist, romantic advice. I'm researching um, Thomas Ferguson Roger, who was a consultant psychiatrist at a number of hospitals around here, and also a professor of psychological medicine at this university from 1948 to 1972. Um, so I'm working through his archive. Hi, my name is Hadi Oken. Um, I'm about to start my postgraduate degree in gender history, so I'm very much here as an introduction <laughs> to what being a researcher is like. Um, I did write my undergraduate dissertation on the student movement and its relationship with the feminist movement in Finland in the 60s and 70s. And one of those chapters was on childhood and marriage, um, and that topic and another on sexuality. So I think I might have some idea of what's going to happen today, but I'm very much here to listen and to learn. I am Sarah Lawson. I'm going into the French Army PhD at the History School at the University of Edinburgh. Um, my thesis looks at the production and consumption of jewellery in 19th century Scotland and is attached to a bigger project that looks at the social and cultural role of artisans in Scotland from 1780 to 1914. Um, so it's a material culture study and many of the, well, most of the objects that I use as sources are tied in in some way with loving relationships with marriage with marriage settlements or as um, kind of family, gender, property. So I'm here to kind of explore that side of the work. I am Amy. I'm also going into the third year of PhD at the University of Edinburgh. 
and um, my PhD is looking at fatherhood and masculinity in late 20th century Scotland. Uh, using all the histories, so obviously marriage, family, gender roles, future children. Okay, I'm Charlie. I'm going to the second year of my PhD here at Glasgow. Um, I'm working on a project about um, heterosexuality in the long 1960s in Scotland. And at the moment, I am, what's the word, drowning inside um, a, a, a project inside that about uh, students and sex. <laughs> yes, and uh, Julian actually in Combinatics. Um, honestly speaking, I'm just an outsider here because my, I'm just going to start my postgraduate at the Business school, so I'm merely an, I don't know, an uh, amateur enthusiast here. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Kathy uh, Walker, I'm a historian at Cardiff University, and um, so I work with mainly within the themes of crime and gender. Um, so at the moment, I'm writing, I'm researching and writing a book about rape like, from 1500 to. 1800s, um, and I'm also involved in <coughs> another project with Alex Shepard that's working at the which is based at the University of Glasgow, um, uh, on women's access to justice in different parts of Britain and Ireland, where they were um, uh, not just marginalised because they were women, but because of language or ethnic or religious um, factors also. I'm Cole. I'm a PhD student attached to the uh, Marriage in Scotland project. Um, my research looks at how marriage affects children, so how the family form and the marriage of the parents can affect childhood experiences in Scotland over the 20th century. Um, so I'm using all the issues and kind of finding out if you're going to have a different childhood outcome coming from a nuclear family or a single parent family or a blended family, kind of comparing those experiences over the 20th century. I'm Ryan and I'm going into my second year uh, at the University of Edinburgh and my project is looking at women accused of murder in both New York City and London from 1865 to 1914 and the, well quite a lot of the murders involve husbands or partners that said they were going to get married and then didn't and the women are a little upset and maybe they take things a bit too far so uh, I'm mostly interested in the idea of like marriage breakdown and how people read. My name is Mary, I'm a PhD student at Church and East European Studies here uh, in Glasgow. Uh, my research is about a scientist uh, in the late 19th century Russia who, uh, his name is Bokachev, he's an uh, Their relationships and their stuff in the early stages. 
I'm Helene uh, Karlbeck uh, from Stockholm, Sweden, South Stockholm uh, University College, and um, I'm doing a uh, marriage, uh, family, and uh, parenthood, various uh, things uh, about Russia, Soviet Russia, actually. Um, and um, I'm right now into fatherhood and masculinities. I'm uh, just starting on that, very interesting. Uh, and I call my, the paper I've uh, presented here and, and pr probably the project also, I call uh, search, the, so the search for, or a search for, uh, for the father uh, reviving family values in socialist uh, Russia from the 1960s and on until the dissolution of Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Penny Morris. I'm here in Glasgow in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures. My um, main research area is, is, is 20th century Italy, uh, and I'm particularly interested in women's history um, and women journalists and writers in particular. Uh, and uh, at this meeting, I've been talking about um, work that I've done on advice columns in 1940s and 1950s Italy, and, and particularly looking at sort of questions of marriage and love, though I've looked at other areas as well, so sort of emotions more generally in the way that they're articulated in, uh, in popular magazines, but they're also how that then compares to literary works too. I'm Ria Thompson and I'm based here in this very building <laughs> um, as part of the History of Working Class Marriage Project on which I am a research assistant. I finished my PhD last year um, and it was on marriage and marriage breakdown in late 20th century Scotland um, and kind of in line with that my interests are kind of oral history, gender history, gender relations specifically sort of 19th, 20th century Scotland and Britain and also the history of emotions. And I, I'm Lindsay Douglas, I'm more here as a kind of an interested observer really, I'm a BBC um, documentary producer and I'm just sort of seeking to inform and, and be inspired for new ideas, mm -hmm. so that's... So, now we open the floor up for questions, um, and I'm going to have particular themes that we're going to talk about, we want to see really really about what you guys want to talk about. So, does anybody, does any of you have any sort of issues or uh, inquiries, I guess, that you would like us to discuss some more? Um, what did you want to get out of the session, I guess? That's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll go first. So, um, because I'm coming from my work from a musical cultural perspective, um, I often wonder if I need to neglect some of the history of emotions and theory and the work that's already been done there in my own work. So part of what I'd like to get out of today is just thinking about um, where to start really and what are the main works, I guess that's a good starting point, or where um, yeah, to kind of get an overview of the field, I suppose, just the field that I understand it a little better, because I'm often just looking at so, um, Anybody got any thoughts on that? Where would you, if you go to start our history of emotions project, which you've all done now, so where was the place to start? Hey, well, I'll tell you what, so I started, <laughs> I have a PhD here at Glasgow, um, and I, there was no such thing as a history of emotions when I started in 2003. And, um, and so I had to use psychologists, and so I, and it was cultural psychologists that I found particularly helpful because these weren't coming at it from the idea that, that biology and the body and emotion is some kind of universal across time. Which some of the more, there are, there's a, a sort of psychology and, and also some of the harder scientists which kind of drive that model. And they were very much more about their, their time and place specific and they're culturally informed and culturally made. So that's where that kind of started off, um, was reading that kind of work. Um, and then kind of implying that to my socials, which were love letters really, and thinking about, well, because the kind of love that I was writing in these letters was not. How we understand today and so what we do with that. And then over time, a field has developed around that. And so I guess the main fears that kind of began that were people like Bobby Reddy, who has his emotional regimes, uh, and Barbara Rosen, who has her emotional communities, um, and, and the Sterns with their emotional energy. Um, but I think since then, so they were kind of the canon for a long time, I think. But since then, people, uh, it's flourished. And so now people, I think, are 
are trying to be more imaginative about how we do it in the first place and less driven by. So they, 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 each of them propose a very specific theory of how the drink motion works. Um, and now I think a lot of people are trying to go, well, I don't feel that we need to have a specific theory that we all get behind and say that's the way you think it works. They, they, they want more flexibility and more movement uh, in, their, in their theories. And so the, the theory is becoming much more diverse and more interesting, I think. Um, so I, I kind of, and say that, I have my own theory. But, um, <laughs> but I kind of come at it from a performance model. So I meet lots of Judy Butler and Ernie Goffman and the anthropologists. And I think about it in terms of performativity, emotion is something that you do, it's a form of social practice. Um, and so therefore, I'm less worried about it as sort of some biological instinct as more sort of socialised process where um, we learn to uh, respond in particular ways um, through our culture um, that are emotional. Um, and then that, oh, because they're social and cultural acts, they tie into larger power structures and, and, and have uh, larger implications that are beyond the individual. Um, so that's my kind of feeling. What about anyone else? How do uh, you guys approach emotion? Right. So I mean, obviously, especially for you know, in the PhD, it's one of the things that you have to, as you all know, that you have to demonstrate. Because it's basically like what you're doing with PhD is saying, I've done my apprenticeship, here is, here is the thing that I've produced because it shows that I meet all the standards of the profession. And one of those things is, of course, that you will have to of the geography into which you work and that you understand the theoretical and methodological frameworks and so on. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to be kind of wet wedded to those. You have to show that. And sometimes that can just be a starting point. Um, and so um, the sort of thing that Katie says is really important as in terms of show uh, that you understand and know what people are really doing in the field and how it's developed. But you don't then, you know, maybe that you would find a particular approach, the one that's actually most useful in practice, is that you can, you know, so you don't have to kind of be wedded to the range of approaches or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, with something like material culture, then you might find more useful not, you know, once you've read the, the stuff that Katie's suggesting, just maybe historians who are talking about emotions and emotional, emotional investments in things, but who nonetheless maybe wouldn't come in, in our historiography of this is a list of history of emotions. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of things like Laura Gavin's recent article a couple of years ago about the bed. Okay. Now, there was in bed, so it's a bit early for me, but she talks about, and I think Angela McShane and John Bacon did something about beds mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, so we're thinking about, well, what, what is the bed? actually mean, and you know, even the best, you know, there were great big bits of furniture, everyone except the poorest people has one, it might be only one, but then there were also other kinds of little chocolate beds that fit under the main bed, and you know, so there was, there was a whole variety of sorts of beds, they were very important in wills, you know, you always made sure that you left your bed to the right person, and it was very maybe upsetting for people to have, not to be agreed the bed, if you thought you were the one that should get it. So, and so the same, so with the kind of things that, um, uh, so obviously not just jewellery, but other personal things, you might find looking at the work of, say, social and cultural and gender stories who happen to talk about these things while they're exploring something else, might actually give you kind of ways in to exploring your own material and to, and to kind of support what you're doing mm -hmm. without it being um, the most obvious things to go looking for. So I'd say that would be the next thing, once you've done what uh, Katie's suggesting, that the next thing would be to, to actually start looking for things, what people have written about yeah. things. Well, I think when writing me, that order, I suppose, so I started with work, but I um, was looking and we kind of right. got in a sense for this bigger field that, yeah, yeah. that exists. And, yeah, so, yeah. Um, but that I didn't know where it was at. No, the, um, I think that's a great, a great suggestion, and I should say I can go expertise in history of emotions, a little a lot of history in my family, that is, I'm trying to remember, or I've been reminded by Katie, being a dissertation kid, oh, my family's got emotions too, but maybe I should do something with that. Um, so I have no expertise on that, but um, on, the, on the Gotham strategy here, one thing that I ran into while working on part of this project was John Stiles' work on family tokens, do you, do you know yeah. that? And he really has a wonderful way there of talking about like what these objects, I mean, and being very sensitive 
do like the context, which I would think is very important for you, yeah. for you too in terms of, of jewelry, but, but also that it came out of working on spinning, you know, a project on spinning, and so that was a kind of side side avenue for him, you know, to get interested in those, to try and look at fabrics. So that would be interesting for you too, I think, you know, to sort of think about, as I feel, obviously, I'm doing the artisans who are producing these, but, you know, where unexpectedly you might look, you know, look for something that would be really rich for you. The, the history of emotions and objects is a, a flourishing field, but when I don't know there's a huge amount being published, there's a lot of people working on it. And they're kind of interesting as well because they're trying to go beyond just how we feel as objects, mm -hmm. but how objects themselves make, like, how the, the right. object has an active input. Right. Right. And that's what particularly you see around, like, a lot of people are doing that work are looking at uh, religious objects, uh, and what do you call them, that when the saint dies and they come to the body and they have a really of it. Relics. Because relics, you know, are, are, are actually designed to make emotions happen in people. That's what they, they, they are, that, that's kind of their role. And so what does, it, how does the object do that? How does the object have a kind of active role in, in, in the right? Well, I was thinking in terms of what you were saying about performance of emotions, then I thought performance of rituals, rituals where these things are given as gifts. You know, what can you find out about the occasions and what it's actually like when so-and-so presents another person with one of these objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you, um, so Diana and Harper's work on tokens, so the early thing, but she goes on with it in the 19th century, does she? Mm, no, not by you, actually. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. But so, I think that's it. might be interesting to about, mm -hmm. about the way that uh, um, for poor people, the tokens that they exchanged for, um, when they got engaged, and then when it went wrong, you know, they, they just had the token, oh. and therefore they had the, you know, the evidence that they had, and then, then the, the other party would say, but I meant nothing when I gave them this token or whatever it was. They could be out of clothing or jewelry, yes. or that one. And so again, it is an earlier period, but you know, people kind of, you know, people don't suddenly go, oh, it's 1900s, or it's yeah. 1900s. <laughs>
Ginger Frost. This will be a bit as a young person. Uh, Rebecca Probert for England. Is it a good book? Yeah, Rebecca Probert. Uh -huh. And uh, Nancy Cott's yeah. book on marriage, uh, private, public vows, talks a lot about how there was a lot of, you know, remote areas where they didn't have any representatives of the state people to live together. It's pretty common. But late 19th century, there's a push to get more formal marriage everywhere. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious how like those married, well, not just kind of those relationships would be seen by the wider community that they're living in, and also just like legally how they were treated differently. Was it a bit different if you? Was it more understandable if you murdered someone who hadn't married you, or <laughs> if they had married you? So. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> would it be probably part? It depends on what you mean by the wider community and what sources you're looking at. So. If you look at, um, so you, um, if you look at, say, O'Bailey proceedings and see what the prosecutors are saying, then they the question or not. more generally is an article by Ruth Davis in the History Workshop Journal from the 1980s, I think it's from 87. But in terms of you know the problematic of your research, it looks like you're, the, the problematic of your research sounds very much like it's on crimes of passion in the broadest sense. So you might want to look at this article by Ruth Harris, AJ. She wrote a book. Yeah. 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 I can't remember the name of her book, but she's a book on that on that same mm -hmm. topic too. It's about France and the um, yeah. and if you want to look at literary source that started a debate, then Tess of the Durbervilles, which yeah. is subtitled A Pure Woman, mm -hmm. about a woman who kills a man who right, yeah, seduced yeah. raped her. And, and there's also Lucy Bland's book, which is a few years ago, uh, on the um, Jewish women who were murdered in France. Uh, often husbands, but sometimes also 